everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, just make sure that you are on mute. Um, and we will get started in just a couple minutes. We're just waiting for a few more people to join in. Um, welcome. My name is Marsha Questel. I am a BCBA. I have my master's in education, special education, and I've been working with people with autism, kids and adults, for almost 18 years now. So um, it's the joy of my life. It's everything that I love to do. And I also have three kids of my own. Um, and, you know, I really feel like working with children is, is just everything I've ever wanted to do. And a lot of that comes from what we're going to discuss today. So I'm very excited to present this to you. Um, now, I just want to remind everybody who is getting CEUs that I'm going to say three keywords throughout the presentation. Okay, so you need to write those down when they happen. They will not be repeated. The keywords can't be repeated. Um, we can't put them in the chat. Um, you can't ask us for them later. So as things come up, when I say the keywords, that is when you write it down. And at the end of the presentation, you're going to email ray at abaskills.com with the three keywords and as well as your, your name and um, your certificate number if you're using it for the BACB CEUs, okay? So just one more minute and we'll get started. Okay, so a welcome again, everybody. <clears throat> Teaching emotional regulation through play. That's what we're discussing today. Again, I'm Marsh Costell, BCBA, and um, remember that you have to write down the three keywords as soon as I tell you. We won't be repeating them. We're putting them in the chat later. And everyone's gonna stay on mute for now. If you would like to vocalize your questions at the end, you may. Um, but instead of that, if you want to put your questions right in the chat, then Ray can ask them to me at the end of the presentation. Okay, so here's an outline of our goals. We're going to define emotion regulation. Um, we are going to ask how does emotion regulation play into overall self-regulation? We will consider what emotion regulation means for children with ASD. How does intellectual ability impact emotion regulation? What information do we have about strategies that positively impact emotion regulation? And what research is missing? How can children express their emotions appropriately? And we are going to discuss what that actually means. And how can we create and utilize engaging play opportunities, <clears throat> excuse me, that will facilitate better emotion regulation? All right. So what does emotional regulation really mean? So I'm going to be using this definition as we discuss ER throughout this presentation. In the general developmental literature, the term emotion regulation refers to the range of cognitive, physiological, and behavioral abilities that allow an individual to monitor and modulate the occurrence, valence, intensity, and expression of one's emotions and arousal. And so what's required for successful ER? Successfully, re successfully regulating one's emotions theoretically requires a child to be able to A, recognize his or her own emotional states at age appropriate levels, access strategies to self-soothe or relax when experiencing a negative emotion or strong levels of excitement or arousal, and C, maintain progress in current activities in the face of potentially interfering emotions. And that's a really big one as well. And what about affect regulation? The ability to monitor one's affect that is being displayed while experiencing emotions that distract from the demands of the current activity is really important. Let's think about being at work. If something happens in the morning at home and you are, um, you know, really distressed when you're on your way to work. It may be a place where you feel free to display whatever emotions are going on inside on the outside, but 
more often than not, we have to really regulate our affect in various settings so that when you walk into work that morning, no matter how hard your morning was with your spouse or your children or the traffic, you need to walk in with a big smile and say, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. <laughs> and even if you're not, and you know, it's not demanding that you be that cheerful, um, it's important to be aware of the affect that you are displaying. So this has been researched as something that can be taught especially in regard to emotional working memory. Children gain greater affect regulation over time, so that's typical, but there are children who are at risk of poor overall self-regulation, emotional regulation, and affect regulation. Okay, so consider the societal norms regarding receiving gifts. This is very difficult for a lot of kids when they are receiving a disappointing gift. And in fact, that's um, one of the exercises that's reviewed in the literature that's in this slide. Um, when they receive a gift, some children already have that toy or they don't like it, or it's like an ugly sweater or just something that they weren't looking forward to. It doesn't have the batteries. So, um, when those things happen, as children progress over time in neurotypical development, they get better and better and better at saying like, thank you, kind of regardless of how they feel really about the gift. So that's kind of one of those cornerstone experiences that most kids experience that they have to learn to be polite and control their affect kind of regardless of their anger or disappointment about what they've received. Other aspects of self-regulation. So two other aspects of self-regulation that are frequently discussed are cognitive regulation, such as executive functioning and goal-directed reasoning and behavioral regulation, right? That's, if you're in the ASD autism world, um, or even just in the behavior analytic world, that's what we focus on the most. So such as monitoring of physical movement and inhibiting or delaying impulses or gratification. Through these three facets of self-regulation, although these three facets of self-regulation are related, evidence suggests that they may hold independent predictive power for children's development. So why is emotional regulation so important? Preschool children with higher levels of emotional intensity and dysregulation in the classroom are rated to have fewer social skills, are less accepted by their peers, and engage in more peer conflict. For children with developmental disabilities, not including ASD, emotional regulation has been shown to predict children's social difficulties above and beyond cognitive ability. So here's a crucial beginning. This piece, like I told you, I'm going to you know, be citing this piece a lot. I just wanted to just put their abstract in full here because it's it's a really crucial, and it's in 2017, right? That's that's just not enough. We don't have enough literature on this. There is a lot of work on emotions for children. There's been, you know, several decades of that, but regarding, you know, kids with ASD, it's, it's poor, it's poorly lacking. So, there's been little research connecting underlying emotion processes, e.g. emotional regulation, to frequent behavior problems in young children with autism spectrum disorder. This study examined the stability of emotion regulation and its relationship with other aspects of child functioning. Participants included 108 children with ASD ages four to seven and their primary caregivers. ASD symptoms and cognitive language abilities were assessed upon study entry. Parents reported on children's emotion regulation, social skills, and behavior problems at two time points, 10 months apart. Emotion dysregulation was stable and related strongly to social and behavioral functioning, but was largely independent of IQ. Further analyses suggested that emotion dysregulation predicts increases in social and behavioral difficulties across time, and implications for intervention are discussed. So please note that this study found that emotion dysregulation can be fairly stable. So if a child doesn't receive the necessary interventions to regulate their emotions better, not only may that not change much over time, but also it has a great impact on their social functioning and their behavioral functioning. Tatsika et al also not too long ago, 2011, demonstrated that children and adolescents 
ages five to 16 with ASD, were more likely to have elevations in parent rated emotional symptoms, internalizing symptoms such as being scared or feeling unhappy, than youth with intellectual disability only or a non clinical comparison group. Indeed, the presence of ASD increased the odds of children's scores falling in the elevated elevated range for emotional symptoms. So IQ really has nothing to do with it. And that may come as a surprise to, to some of you. Um, it was a bit surprising to me. In contrast to the relationships with social and behavioral functioning, ratings on emotional regulation were unrelated to cognitive or language abilities. This is significant in this study as 88% of the children had IQ scores in the typical range, su suggesting that high levels of cognitive abilities may not be a protective factor for children with ASD against emotional regulation difficulties. So here, you know, that means to me that when we have like high functioning people with autism, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be protected as it says here from emotional dysregulation. Emotional dysregulation is predictive of social and behavioral difficulties. Further analyses suggested that emotion dysregulation predicts increases in social and behavioral difficulties across time. The authors found that various measurements of emotional dysregulation predicted internalizing behaviors, right? So appearing to exhibit negative emotions, exhibiting fewer positive emotions, and externalizing behaviors like attentional issues and aggressive behaviors. And that's right where behavior analysts are often focusing is those externalizing behaviors that they can easily measure. The results of this work show that emotional dysregulation can remain somewhat stable across time without intervention and that it's being correlated with social and behavioral difficulties, even to the extent of being a predictor of these struggles. Okay, so for those of you getting CEUs, I'm going to put your first slide, your first keyword right here, it's family. Family is your first keyword for CEUs. Remember you have to write it down and we will not be repeating it or putting it in the chat. You have to write it down so that you can send it to ray at abaskills.com at the end when you have all three keywords. Okay. So it's all about behavior, isn't it? Yes, the research is right? When we're treating ASD, applied behavior analysis is what we do. However, emotional regulation is a term not often used in the autism spectrum literature as the behavioral symptoms that likely represent emotion regulation difficulties, including tantrums, meltdowns, aggression, and self-injury are highlighted instead. Extensive research documents the heightened behavioral difficulties facing children with ASD, but a specific focus on emotion regulation, particularly during the early school years, is lacking with few exceptions. So no, it's not all about behaviors. I'm talking to you behaviorist, hear me out. So I, Ray, all of us at ABA Skills, we are behaviorists, right? We are, we are all about behavior analysis. We use the science of behavior analysis to successfully treat the symptoms of autism, but that doesn't mean that we need to only focus on consequences in our BIPs, right? So if you're creating a behavior intervention plan or if you're a parent who has a child with ASD and a behavior intervention plan is being created for them, we have to think about the fact that emotion regulation and the science um, and the research behind studying it in relation to people with ASD is really lacking. So rather than always focusing on the behaviors like self-injury and aggression and tantrums and foul language, the authors suggest that if emotion regulation is linked to increases or maintenance of these symptoms, that a more parsimonious intervention will be one that addresses emotion regulation. Okay, so now I am talking to you behaviorist. Remember parsimony? Parsimony is a principle of ABA, right? It's one of the things we learn way in the beginning when we're studying ABA. It means we should find simple explanations and use common sense. In a field where our clinicians and researchers are more often than ever before, considering issues like individual preference, cultural sensitivity, and compassionate care, our research on ER is quite limited. And it reflects our focus on the outward behaviors that we can quantify 
rather than the cognitive behaviors or emotional regulation of our learners. There have been some amazing talks in, in recent conferences. There have been some incredible articles being written about being really sensitive to your clients or to your learners and really thinking about what does it mean to teach a typical level of functioning? And a lot of behaviorists in the field, and I think the field as a whole is reflecting on this, that we can't be ableist, right? That we can't be always pushing for people with ASD to kind of rise to a level that is expected, but that we really have to think about who they are as individuals, what the parents are, all, you know, and if we're doing parent training, what the parents are really experiencing and what we can expect of them and what's culturally relevant to them, not only in their culture, like where they're from and their background, but also the culture of their family unit and kind of their parenting style. If we are going to win and get as many people to access the science of behavior analysis, we have to be more sensitive to the real human issues related to having a child with learning differences rather than just kind of coming in with our box of tools and saying, I'm going to you know, treat these behaviors regardless of, of the context, right? That I'm just going to treat these behaviors with the science that I know works to decrease problematic behaviors and increase skill acquisition, right? I mean, that is what we need to do, but I think that the lack of research in ER as it relates to ASD is reflective of this kind of newer wave of, of the perspective we're having in the field. So just remember parsimony that if you have a child or even an adult who's engaging in a lot of, you know, externalizing behaviors, right, and a lot of, of behaviors that are seen as dysfunctional, that the emotional piece of it isn't something to just kind of put on the back burner and treat the behavior alone. That to have a successful BIP, you really should be including the emotional regulation piece in it because that would be more parsimonious. So ER is highly correlated with ASD. Remember that we said it's really not about IQ or like level of functioning, but it is about ASD. And this is a, a wonderful table from that same from the same work that I've been citing, emotional regulation appears to be a construct independent of some core measures of child functioning like cognitive development and language functioning, given non-specific correlation with these domains. However, emotion regulation is highly correlated with measures of children's autism symptomology, social skills, and behavioral functioning. So see table four, this is table four. And you can see you know, we, we look at these, these on the left are the um, emotional regulation scales, the rating scales. And then over here is where you see autism severity score, autism symptoms, social skills, and behavior problems. Right? And this is where we see that high correlation. So it's a missing focus. The authors posit that while there's research to show that emotional regulation impacts social outcomes for neurotypical children or those with disorders, that little research is focused on the impact that emotion regulation has on social outcomes for people with ASD. So here's what we know so far. Emotional regulation is only one piece of self-regulation, right? There's the behavioral and cognitive that also play important roles. Emotional regulation is independent of intellectual ability. Emotional regulation is highly correlated to the symptoms of ASD. Increases in emotional dysregulation are correlated with increases in ASD symptomology ratings. Lots of research has focused on the external measurable behaviors, even though emotional dysregulation is associated with ASD symptoms and the occurrence of those measurable behaviors. Treating behaviors through a functional behavioral intervention plan is well-researched and has proved applicable, applicable. <laughs> 
applicable at reducing maladaptive or antisocial dysfunctional behaviors, but there is not enough research on teaching emotional regulation strategies as opposed to simply providing consequences in the environment to reinforce or punish externally exhibited behaviors, right? So that's, that's really what to kind of take away so far in this workshop is that we have such a focus on treating behavior and, and addressing kind of the symptom, right? Rather than what's going on underneath. And I think it's a like a, a scary thing for behavior analysts to think about cognitive behavior, um, but it doesn't have to be, okay? So that's, that's where we're going next. So to date, many interventions for children with ASD have focused on addressing behavior problems through systematic behavior management, positive behavior supports, reinforcement of alternative behaviors, while at the same time teaching social skills through modeling and repetition. I'm sure if you're a clinician, you're very familiar with this. Even interventions focused on socio-emotional development have largely involved teaching children about emotions via tasks that are isolated from the complexities of the social environment, teaching children to match emotional facial expressions on cards with appropriate labels, and most importantly, removed from the children's own emotional experiences. This, this is the problem. If you have a program which I'm sure many parents and professionals do, have a program that says, you know, labels emotions. More often than not, that means that a child is looking at cards and is either touching the card when someone gives them the name of the emotion, let's say in a field of three, or they are labeling the emotion when someone asks, how do they feel? So you might have a young child, three or four years old, you have a picture of a sad kid, a mad kid, and a surprise kid. And you say, touch sad, show me sad. And the child touches and you say, great job, that's sad. And is that a foundational piece to them knowing how to ID emotions? Sure it is, of course it is. And I think that that is something that often has to happen. You control the stimuli, you make sure that it's really a sad face that is, um, can be discriminated against an angry face or a surprised or scared face. Um, and then you also show the card for the expressive component and you say, how do they feel? And the child says, you know, they look sad, they look angry. Okay, good, fine. That is a fine starting place. But as you can see here, I called it bingo because this is a huge take home, that it is not enough to teach emotional vocabulary, let's say, and labels in this controlled fashion and not have a child experience and label and understand and deal with their own emotions as they happen in a real context. That's so key and is, is really, really lacking in a lot of research and in a lot of programming. So play is important. Children with, children with autism show significant deficits in symbolic or make-believe play, using pretend actions with objects and limited abilities in functional play. Functional and symbolic play skills have been found to be significantly correlated with receptive and expressive language. In contrast to deficits in functional object use and symbolic play, children with autism often perform at sim similar or sometimes even higher levels on non-social constructive play, like using objects in combination to create a project and puzzle solving in comparison with typically developing children or children with language delays at the same language stage. So children with autism, as they're lacking in symbolic play and make-believe play, that is actually correlated significantly with their language skills. So although emotional regulation is not um, significantly correlated with language skills in terms of the actual regulation piece or intellectual development, it is, it play is correlated with language skills. So it, it can, to me, act as a bridge that way. Make play a priority. 
like dishes, emails, chores, homework, extracurriculars, realize that this may be a need, need to become a must for you. Children must learn play skills. Play is not fluff. It's not something extra to do. It is vital. Play allows children to use their creativity while developing their imagination, dexterity, and physical, cognitive, and emotional strength. Play is important to healthy brain development. It is through play that children at a very early age engage and interact in the world around them. Play allows children to create and explore a world they can master, conquering their fears while practicing adult roles, sometimes in conjunction with other children or adult caregivers. As they master their world, play helps children develop new competencies that lead to enhanced confidence and the resiliency they will need to face future challenges. Thank you, AAP. That is the greatest way to say it ever. They completely summed up why we need to increase play skills for children. When you have neurotypical children, you find that they play and engage with the world in this magical way, that they just encounter things and start playing with them just by osmosis. It's just, it's remarkable. And then when you have children with learning differences, it can be extremely hard to know how to tap into that, to that magic, right? How to tap into that world and get them to play when they seem so disinterested in play. Um, that is really, really difficult, but for children, again, it is really, really vital that children learn how to play. This is not about floor time, right? I know I just said like this magical children world, but currently DIR floor time simply does not meet the basic standards of care for use as a treatment intervention. Okay, it doesn't. Specifically, there is little to no objective evidence of effectiveness. Do we know some people who use floor time? Okay, sure. But should it distract from, you know, intensive behavioral intervention? No, it should not. Should it be used as a treatment? No, it should not. Do you think when I go to someone's house, I'm just like following their kid around and, and just like doing what they want to do? No, I am not. Okay, we are using all behavior analytic principles here. And as we move forward through, you know, the rest of the presentation, I just want to make sure that there is a very clean discrimination between those things. Okay. When we are doing things like incidental teaching, there is science behind that. When we're doing things like man training, there is science behind that. When we're doing things like, you know, increasing language acquisition through various reinforcers, of course, these are the things that we're doing. We are not doing floor time. Okay. So, if you ever hear me or other professionals talking about play, make sure that they're not talking about floor time, but that they're talking about using play opportunities to create novel experiences that promote flexibility, you know, cognitive flexibility, emotional flexibility, being able to care for and engage with other people in new and ever-changing play situations. Okay, that's that's where we wanna go. We wanna make sure that we can engage with our learners in a way that their peers will. Because when, when a child with ASD encounters children at school, they're not just going to follow their, their lead all the time, right? That, that just would not be something we would expect. We would expect that those children have their own expectations, that those children have their own desires of how to interact with this person and that our learner needs to be able to navigate all of the social nuance and the demands that come along with playing effectively, using their language effectively and learning through those play experiences. That's how we will set them up for success in the future. I'm gonna pause right there and give you your second word. It is game. G-A-M-E, game. Remember, it won't be repeated. You have to write it down now. Game. Okay. 
So on theory of mind, theory of mind is one of my most favorite things to, to research because to me, theory of mind is a huge, huge component of, of what happens with autism, right? That, that there's, a, there's a deficit here and obviously that's, that's well researched as well. Although theory of mind is typically seen as referring to the ability to assess other people's mental states, there's strong evidence that the processes of assessing one's own and others' mental states are closely related. This suggests that theory of mind deficits might also lead to difficulties assessing one's own mental states. That is something that people typically don't discuss, right? If we're talking about theory of mind, usually we're talking about someone's ability to understand another's perspective. For example, a common task that I will do <clears throat> when I'm assessing someone's perspective taking abilities and theory of mind abilities is the false belief task. It's very simple, it's very quick and easy, and it's very revealing. So I will be either playing with a child, you know, doing something with them, or I'll be in the middle of a consultation and I'll tell the parent to leave their phone on the table. And then I'll say to the child, okay, look, as their parent steps out of the room and I'll contrive this whole situation that the parent leaves the room and leaves their phone there. So, okay, look, I'm gonna hide the phone under the table. Don't tell mom, okay? I'm just gonna leave it under the table. So I leave the phone under the table, mom comes back and you ask the child, where does mom think the phone is? Their theory of mind, if it were fully intact, and you know, this happens sometimes, it's also not fully developed always in early intervention because it's not something that comes of age yet. So it is down the line in early childhood development, but either they haven't gotten there just in neurotypical development or they haven't gotten there because of a deficit. They, if they don't have false belief, they would say, mom thinks it's under the table because they know it's under the table and the facts are that it's under the table, they would say, mom knows it's under the table. If their theory of mind was intact, either by neurotypical progression or by it just being intact, they would say, mom thinks it's on the table. Mom doesn't know where it is. So we're most often talking about in ASD, someone's ability to think about another person's perspective. And uh, that's, that common task is the false belief task. Now, to have it be understood that theory of mind also relates to one's own thinking is an interesting way to consider theory of mind. And I think it's important for everyone to know because to think about your own thinking, right? Metacognition that's to kind of step outside of yourself and look in and say like, what am I thinking about and why? And to understand your own mental processes and to understand your own thinking. So keep that in mind as we move forward and in your own practice and in thinking about yourself and your own children, thinking about the area of mind in that complex way, rather than only in the like perspective taking typical fashion that we talk about it. So on that note, <clears throat> this manual is the only manual that I found that really discusses thinking about feelings, exploring feelings and like strategies to really address them for people with autism. And it's focused on high functioning autism Asperger's disorder, right? So that kind of HFA, um, population that we know typically has very good intellectual functioning and typically has some strong language skills, um, but also still has diagnoses uh, in the autism spectrum. Children with ASD need to be able to identify and understand their emotions and learn to understand what to do when others share or display their emotions, right? That's something that's extremely difficult. And so the things that we're gonna discuss aren't only about HFA high functioning or Asperger's, they're gonna be all across, 
um, even from early intervention when there's not a ton of language development, that the things that we discuss here, I have experienced can be applied to various populations. And like we said earlier in the presentation, you know, intellectual functioning is not um, tightly correlated and predictive of emotional regulation, right? They're separate. And that play skills are tightly correlated with language and, you know, social skills. So that's, again, that's where we're building this bridge is that if we can teach some play skills and get through that doorway into teaching emotional regulation, that's how we're going to get kids to not only engage in, in more play, but that we can use the play to really address emotional regulation and, and perspective taken, that theory of mind piece. So stress and anger management program stamp for young children. This manual is fantastic. It's available, it's available on Amazon. I definitely suggest that people go and grab it. Um, and it's, a, it's an easy read, okay? It's, it's not super lengthy and it's not um, super technical with a lot of jargon. It really does make sense. It's very parsimonious. Okay, so affective education. I really like that word um, because it's just a play on effective education, but emotional identification, right? <laughs> this is usually where the research ends, right? As we discussed, that whole process of receptive and expressive emotion identification, but that's just the beginning here, right? That's just step one. Then also sensory identification, how it feels when you feel an emotion and trigger and warning sign identification. What situations may be concerning to me? What usually happens when I feel this way? For me, if I was feeling anxious, I might note that my shoulders tense up or that I'm breathing more heavily, right? Even, you can even trick yourself into having <laughs> anxiety by even just playing those experiences. So, Sensory identification is really important. And as a behaviorist, you can say that, you know, you're going to incorporate that sensory ID into your emotional ID program. So you're going to place reinforcement strategies on IDing the sensory component of the emotion. So if someone is looking at a sad picture and they can point to sad, and they can express sad, and then you have an experience with them where they are crying or their lip is out like this, you can say, right, see your lip is out. You can identify that. You can identify that your, your face is wet. You're sad. This is what sad feels like. This is how you know someone is sad. I also use this piece of learning when I'm teaching the how do you know program. So I often have a how do you know program where I have kids tell me how they know something. I'll isolate different sensory components. So I'll like, you know, hide things inside a bag and have them feel inside and say, what is it? And they'll say, it's a car. Well, how do you know? And they have to describe the components of a car, right? Which, which actually is an extension of, of parts of a whole when you're teaching that functional relationship of and of parts of a whole of objects and that they can describe and feel things and you put something inside and you say tell me what it is without them you know hearing or seeing the object they have to id it same thing i'll like go behind a wall and clap and they'll say i'll say what did i do and they'll say you clapped how do you know because i heard you and those things are really also important for kids to start getting into some self-advocacy because when people ask children with autism questions that are a bit abstract, like how things happen and how do you know that they happen and to justify what they're experiencing or what they're expressing, those are some really important components. Again, also built in through fun, interactive programming. So that's, that's another key takeaway. And so when we go into affective education and we're talking about sensory ID and trigger and warning sign ID, we're going to pick up on those types of teaching opportunities where we can say, you know, how do you know the character 
is feeling that way. Oh, because I see that their lip is down or I can see that their cheeks are wet from crying. That's how I know. That's how that feels. And then trigger and warning sign ID is something that we're going to simulate in the play situations as well. Skill building, the emotional toolbox. Release and soothe emotional arousal. Seek help and engage in pleasurable activities. Again, in the stamp manual, they have a huge list with pictures and descriptions and conversations to have with kids to really discuss strategies for these three things, for releasing and soothing, seeking help, and engaging in pleasurable activities. That is a cognitive behavioral therapy manual, but it built for children with high functioning autism and Asperger's, but we are gonna be able to use those principles and apply them to our play situations. Okay, so again, releasing and soothing is things like deep breathing, right? And walking away, closing your eyes, help seeking, knowing who to turn to in, and, and what to say in order to gain help for what is agitating you or what is upsetting you. And engaging in pleasurable activities means stepping away from this thing, perhaps asking for a break, right? And in, in our behavior analytic world, the negative reinforcement component can never be denied. You can add as much positive reinforcement as you want on a situation <clears throat> and it's not gonna pair it with reinforcement. Sometimes you just need a break from that. And it, you know, it doesn't matter how much you wanna make this fun or make it okay for someone. If they don't like it, or they don't like the teaching strategy or the activity, but it's just something that they have to learn. Negative reinforcement is a really good way to increase the skill acquisition, right? So on that, we also need to have pleasurable activities that a person can turn to when they are feeling emotional arousal. And cognitive restructuring, change the way a child thinks about a situation. Okay, it's used to address issues related to deficits in theory of mind, as we discussed, rigidity and perceptions or misunderstandings about social situations, and how to seek clarity. And training to engage in the pleasurable thoughts to combat the displeasing thoughts. So if you can't physically break away to engage in a pleasurable activity, perhaps you can break away cognitively to engage in some pleasurable thinking. Maybe you can do a relaxation exercise and imagine that you're on the beach. I know that's what I would like to do, <laughs> right? So we can teach those things. And that again, requires some symbolic play, some imaginative thinking. And again, we can build up those skills through play situations in order to gain those skills you reinforce the imaginative play and increase the abstraction of the play so that eventually the child can do things like imagine you're in a place and perhaps you've increased your describing programming and you can tell them, how does it feel? Again, how do you know? How do you know you're on the beach? Tell me about it. How does it feel? And if we did all that sensory programming, they can say things like, I can smell the salt air. I can feel my feet in the sand. I can feel the breeze. I can see the palm trees, right? We want to make sure that we're increasing the, the abstract play that kids are able to engage in so that they can translate those things as well to abstract thoughts, the metacognition, thinking about their own thinking, and it's going to build in that way. So how can we give children practice with dealing with their own emotions without enticing too much raw emotion? That's really important. Discover the power of play and how it can be used to teach complex emotional awareness, emotional vocabulary, perspective taking, and strategy rehearsal. Let's check out one example. Okay, so this, I'm gonna show you a quick video of a play situation that I did with a child that built in a lot of the programming that we had worked on. And it's kind of built in with the, um, with, with, you know, text that you'll be able to see 
what programs I was referring to when we created this play scenario. And as you're watching it, note that, you know, we didn't just arrive at this <laughs> in a day. We arrived at this play situation through a lot of language programming and a lot of emotional training, and you'll see why. As you can see, you know, that was a super fun activity. I hope you noted his, his pretending of relief, right? So he went like this, right? When, when we got away from the lava, the lava was scary. Now for this particular learner, his tolerance of other people's, um, you know, really vibrant negative emotions was really, really difficult for him. Um, he would immediately pretend that he was, you know, upset about something and, and cry out and get angry at somebody if they were upset. So if a, if a child in his classroom was doing something that was, you know, like crying or, or angry or yelling, it was really disturbing for him. And, and maybe he didn't understand why that was happening, but what he did display was, you know, a real, real hard time that he was, you know, yelling and, and saying, I need help and I'm hurt when, you know, he wasn't, he was, he was imitating that behavior. And I think it was a mechanism of gaining, gaining attention to himself and helping him to cope with the display of the other person. So when you see me, in this video saying things like, oh, I'm so scared. You know, like I really put it on for him as much as I could. I would really say things through all of our imaginative play that we would be doing 
in this situation and many others, I would really, you know, act out as much as I could in ways that I think his peers might, his cousins might, you know, his, his family members might, that he might experience those things, other people suddenly displaying those things that might disturb him, right? So I would do it in this controlled setting where I had the control over the environment, access to positive reinforcement for him handling it well, access to negative reinforcement to cut the activity if I felt like it, you know, I didn't want to take it any further. So you use the play situation to contrive scenarios that can really um, elicit the response that the child would be feeling and engaging in behaviors that they would be engaging in in the real natural setting. But it's it's a bit muted, it's a bit dialed down, and you have control over so many other aspects of it. You don't have to like continue crying if you're putting on an upset face for someone so that they can engage in behaviors like asking you if you need help or something. You don't have to you know, <laughs> cry and go on and have a tantrum the way that someone in their classroom might. You're starting to introduce that to give them that first reacting, reacting part that you're gonna mediate with them in live time, right? That's really where you wanna get to when you're teaching through play, is that it can mimic life, but in a controlled fashion where you are controlling all the reinforcement and the contingencies that are around. Here's something that we also, that we also shared, okay? We shared, a, a script with him. So if someone's upset, what do you do? You can ask if they want a hug. That's something that he likes to do with his family members. Say sorry if you did something wrong. Ask, are you okay? Or do you need help? And stay calm. And now stay calm is abstract, but we had talked about what staying calm means when we were building this in. So sometimes you have to just wait for them to feel better and be patient. That's a very hard one. And if you do steps one to five, things will get better eventually, okay? Do not yell or scream. Don't hit the person. Don't only talk to yourself about it. Don't make yourself upset and pretend to be upset. These things could make it worse, right? Like if he goes up to a kid and, and, and is aggressive or, 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 you know, pretending he's upset, that could upset that person more and only snowball the effect that he's feeling. You can be calm and even stay happy and help someone feel better. So we were role playing with this script a lot where I would engage in some, you know, small portion of, of emotional behavior. And then I would talk him through it immediately. Like, so I would put on some act of being upset or being angry that I lost a game or something. And then I'd say, remember, you can ask if I need help like immediately so that I'm just putting the, the rule and the prompt built into the SD, right? So again, when we talk about behavior analysis, that's what we're doing here. We're not doing floor time. We're not just like spontaneously engaging in random bouts of behavior and, and making them desensitized to it without support, no. We are using the scenario as a proactive approach to coach them through the experience. So scripts, mnemonic devices, sing songs can be easier to remember for kids. They can create better automaticity and remembering rules and using strategies. And they're a stepping stone to more in-depth discussion and teaching. So when we were using this script, we also would talk about why. You know, I would say like, if you're calm and you're happy when your friend is upset, you can offer them help and help them feel better, thus decreasing the aversive stimuli in the environment and helping him to gain, you know, the negative reinforcement. When he provides a helping behavior to someone, there's a greater likelihood that he's going to have that, that stimuli be ceased. It's going to go away. He's going to escape from that person being upset if he's helpful to them. Maybe not always, and that's where the being patient part comes in. And when I was teaching him, sometimes you just have to wait. Like if a kid is having a really hard time, you just have to wait that out and not engage with them. But that tolerance is also something that we 
that we systematically increased over time with differential reinforcement was his ability to be patient and wait for someone to feel better, even if he had engaged in some of his coping strategies and helping behaviors. So you may need to begin by increasing your overall play curriculum. I totally understand that. I know that for a lot of people um, watching right now in live time and who may watch this video later, you may say, wait a second, how can I even do this when my learner doesn't engage in any of this pretend play at all? They have no play skills and they don't show any interest in play. You know, that may be part of what you need to start doing right away so that you can unlock play for your, for, as a teaching opportunity. So clearly this evidence and support for increasing your child's play skills. Like we've discussed that already in this presentation. We need to increase children's play skills and for adolescents and adults, increase their leisure skills. Not only will this open up social opportunities for the child so that they can play with their peers, with the games and activities that you teach. So like just the teaching of the play skill itself can open up opportunities for them to play with peers but it will likely lead to avenues for leisure skills, reinforcement options, platforms for communication, a cascade of social opportunities, activities to advance executive functioning, and play activities that may further theory of mind. And before I move on, I just want to mention that as I increase play skills with someone, we may advance through some of the easier quicker games into things that um, are harder, just cognitively, just with the executive function, the EF piece, that they need to like retain some amount of information and exhibit greater control over their, over their theory of mind as well, like hiding their cards, knowing that I can see them. That can be very, very challenging if you're playing a game with someone and they're just showing their cards if they're playing with a peer, that peer is gonna say, you know, I see your cards and then take advantage of it. So we have to teach them that, that you can see their cards, right? Or you can, or that you can understand something that they, or you have cards that they don't see and that you know things that they don't know. And with the executive functioning piece, that working memory thing of like um, advancing through games itself is, you know, increasingly difficult. So make sure that you aren't skipping play. And I know I sound redundant at this point, but make sure that you aren't skipping play um, as a humongous roadway, not just an avenue, but a huge roadway to teaching the skills that you're working on in really fun and engaging ways. So to begin, expand the emotional vocabulary, right? We talked about this. Can this be done at the table? Yes, you can start with the emotions card set. I'm not like against that in order to teach some of the preliminary skills, but do not let it end there. As soon as a small set of emotions is learned, bridge the practice of displaying these emotions and discuss them with characters and a wide range of play experiences and stories. We all know that, you know, you may need to control the stimuli and then teach generalization, right? That's something that we have to do. In one of Ray's recent workshops, he was like, teach one and probe for generalization. Teach one, same thing here, right? We need to probe for generalization across many people, characters, videos, experiences. And you do not need to wait until a card set is mastered to try using it in a natural context, okay? In fact, it may be best to build it into your BIP immediately, right? So if, if a child is, um, engaging in some em emotional behaviors and they're displaying emotional dysregulation, it may be to your benefit, and of course every learner is different, but it may be to your benefit to build in emotional vocabulary right off the bat, right? One of the big mantras that I give to nearly all of my learners is I feel because, right? It's just a really quick, easy statement to memorize. And it starts off really basic, but can become more and more complex. I recently had a teenager tell me, I feel sad because the movie theater is closed. I feel upset because school is closed. And that is something that this teenager 
would have never expressed, you know, before we were doing this training. And for someone who engages in some like very rigid behaviors and is, you know, a, a people pleaser and wants to get things done the right way, engaging in emotional expression was always very difficult because it would lead to a distraction from like the task. So for this person to start engaging in some of those I feel because statements has been remarkably impactful in a pretty short period of time because they're able to say things as soon as a task becomes difficult, say things like, I feel frustrated because this is really hard. And today this person said to me, I feel frustrated because I don't know what to say. And that was an incredible statement, right? When we think about the theory of mind piece, right? Knowing that you don't know and expressing it through an emotional, you know, totally appropriate using emotional vocabulary, emotional expression was absolutely fantastic and something to be celebrated. And then I even asked, okay, you're frustrated because you don't know what to say. Do you want me to help you with it? Or do you want to take a break? And this person chose to take a break, which was even greater flexibility, right? For this person who wanted to usually just stay on task and finish the task to step away and breathe and come back like with this renewed sense of calm to finish the task was, I mean, like I, I was pretty much like done for the day after that. I was like, we're good here. You know, like job's done for the day because it was such a wonderful celebratory moment for this person to share with me how they feel, know why they feel that way and to problem solve and say, I'm gonna, okay, that rather than a tantrum, like any day of the week, right? I'm sure anyone could agree that you'd much rather someone just express how they're feeling and get the help that they need. And maybe they're breaking away from the task at hand, but that's something that can be super encouraged. And of course, you may reach a point where someone is using that language to escape and it becomes very escape maintained. And then you just increase their systematic tolerance to the task. And you, you, know, you say, okay, let's work on that waiting piece or let's work on that increased tolerance piece. And then you just work stepwise with them through that. Okay, sorry, little tangent there, but emotional vocabulary is really important, but you have to build it into the natural environment as soon as possible. Be sure to expand it into things beyond happy and mad and sad. I get so annoyed when I hear people who are, you know, advanced in their childhood saying things like, I'm sad, when like that's not the applicable vocabulary that they should be using. They should be saying things like, I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated, I'm excited, I'm angry, I'm uncomfortable, I'm embarrassed, right? That's much greater than saying sad. And it gives us a lot more information and it's much more detailed in them describing the experience that they're having. So these all and many, many more need to be defined, displayed and rehearsed, okay? We need to create some discrimination training between these things because there's a big difference between being disappointed and being embarrassed. Physiologically, they may feel the same and your affective education may be quite similar, right? When someone just looks sad but are they disappointed or uncomfortable or embarrassed, right? That's something to really think about. Okay, so once you've got that first start small set, you can start playing. Um, there are many different kinds of play. Now I have the link here for anyone to refer to who's gonna be getting our um, PDFs, but I'm not going to um, link to it right now, but it's our previous workshop and it's on, it's on YouTube, so you can go see it for free. You only have to pay a small nominal fee if you're gonna get the CEUs from the video, but you can go check it out on the ABA Skills YouTube channel. Helping Siblings Play Together covers a lot of um, play education and, and like how to get kids to start playing in new ways and build off the skills that they currently have. So there are many different kinds of play. Almost 90 years later, we're still using Mildred Parton's discoveries about play. The first three types of play are not always talked about, but they're important developmental milestones. And the parentheses 
um, reveal when these types of play may be observed, but they don't end there. These kinds of play persist through childhood and adulthood, right? Like when I look at parallel play, that's like two people playing near each other who aren't necessarily talking a lot, right? I do that with my husband all the time. If I'm like reading a paper and he's reading a magazine, we are parallel doing a leisure activity, right? We, we start talking less about play and more about leisure and hobbies, but it still can be broken into these different ways pretty easily. Okay, so play strategies or platforms. And then I just put an asterisk play forms. I don't know, we could come up with a new word for that. But using play strategies as platforms for teaching. Pretend play is a very good one with characters like that could be humanoid, like, you know, superheroes and villains, but you could also use vehicles, animals, shapes. It doesn't really matter. You must be mindful of what your learner will understand about the characters, but you should attempt to stretch the items that you're playing with. Perhaps begin with the most relatable forms and then work your way through greater abstraction. Like anyone or anything should be able to say hi. I should be able to say to a kid like with my little hands, right? Like, hello, hey, how are you? Right, and just do silly things like that. I should be able to use, um, you know, my coffee mugs and my water. And you'd be like, hi, I'm coffee. I'm water, I'm so cold and refreshing. I make you feel better. <laughs> okay, so there, there should be some way that we can stretch and stretch and stretch our conversation training and our play skills training to become more and more and more abstract. That's really important. Also gameplay, like any board game, card games, game shows, organized games, physical play, climbing, obstacle courses, races, walks, um, really complex sports can be very difficult, okay? Um, and also they have a lot of arousal when you're talking about like um, winning and losing and trying physically very hard to win. So just be mindful about that. Unless you have somebody who is sports oriented that you're teaching, um, physical play in organized sports can become very complicated, especially in regards to, you know, like if you're playing soccer, owning the ball and, and not sharing it with your teammates and just all of the complexities that can come in with um, sports training, but it is it is wonderful um, as a platform for kids who are sports oriented or that can become sports oriented if they're not. Okay, the arts, music, poetry, short stories, word games, drawing, coloring, any of those, and acting like simple problem solution acts. Okay, you can do role playing, you can do scripts, um, and you can just do spontaneous role playing um, and acting out. But also when we look at things like gameplay, very simple to put in losing because we often entice our learners to win when we're teaching them the game, right? We, we want them to learn the game to some level of mastery and fluency such that it can be generalized to other people in the family and, and other peers. But those peers may not always let them win or if they win, those peers might be upset about it. So it's, it's a great platform, very simply to just start talking about feelings in regard to winning and losing. And poetry and short stories and things like that <clears throat> can be generated easily with like drawing a picture um, and showing how someone feels because something happened in the picture and writing a little story about it. You can also write songs about it. I have a learner that I write songs with all the time and we just create silly songs that are helpful in perspective taking and emotion regulation. So you must know your learner really, really well. What situations often lead to displays of emotional dysregulation for this person? Sometimes it's rigidity, right? Insisting on sameness with rules and who wins and what phrases are used and unmet expectations and missing materials can be really upsetting. Repetitive question asking, like, are they going to insist that they ask you a lot of things until they're answered? And, you know, even if the questions are asked about known information, just like wanting to repeat them so that they can get that assurance or just as a form of stereotypy that they're engaging in. Disappointment can be very, very difficult. Waiting can be really difficult and is really important because there's so much time spent in transition when kids are in school 
between setup and, you know, and then breakdown and setup of the next activity. There's a lot of waiting involved, which can entice a lot of, you know, just that physiological response of frustration. Okay, what else can you predict as difficult for your learner? As I always say, and this is just another mantra that I use for my parent training all the time, is prediction equals prevention. Does it always? No. But the longer version is the more you can predict, the more proactive you can be at preventing things. The more I know about my learner and what is difficult for them, the more stepwise I can be in the enticement of their emotions in the play situations that I create and then being really supportive about where I place differential reinforcement and negative reinforcement in the play situation. So more than likely a lack of true functional language training is often a part of it. Please stop insisting on totally appropriate and polite behavior. There's an expectation of perfection that is pervasive in ABA applied to people's learning differences that is recently, in, you know, I think in the last five, 10 years, um, being highlighted as something that needs to change. So please stop putting the emphasis on being nice rather than being a self-advocate for the person because that can be harmful. If they can't truly advocate for themselves, um, that's not what we want. We don't want them to just be like, nice and go with the flow all the time and make other people comfortable. We also need them to be able to stand up for their own experiences and their own perspectives. For example, if someone's taking too long in a game, the learner should be able to just say like, hey, it's your turn, right? And display a little bit of frustration, not being rude, but just a little bit of like, hey, come on, it's your turn, you should go. Because that is what every other kid does. <laughs> Right? Every other kid, if you're just sitting there not paying attention or you like check your phone or you walk away to go get a cup of coffee or whatever you're doing and they're just sitting there waiting, they're going to express that. They're going to say something in their tone or with their words to say like, hey, you go. It's your turn. If someone grabs their toy, they shouldn't. Should they say, give it back, please? Or should they say, that's mine. Give it back. Right? We need to teach. And again, in ASD, we often find that tone and inflection is something that's lacking, right? We have to teach the difference between question asking and statements and being loud and quiet and vocal control. Make sure that you're just weaving that into the emotional regulation piece and, and self-advocacy. Here's my big like tantrum that I'm having with my all caps and my bold here. If someone pushes them, should they say, please stop? Or what are you doing? Stop, right? That they should stand up for themselves and be loud. Put yourself in their shoes. How would you act? How would you want a child to stand up for themselves? The rules aren't different for them. In fact, they may need more resistance language to draw attention away from their behavior and towards that of a peer. Okay, so do consider the affect training as noted in slide five. We talked about like, you know, being aware of your emotions and having to put a smile on when you go into work, regardless of what's going on inside and that, you know, if somebody is coping with an emotion, they may need to push through in order to complete a task and that like emotional working memory piece that we discussed. But we can't expect that a person with learning differences who may already be somewhat stigmatized in their school or in other environments that the people around who witness this situ situation aren't going to likely judge and look at their behavior more harshly than they do the other person, okay? Don't, don't take that for granted because it, it and it's, it's not like fear mongering. I think most kids that I work with are in really supportive learning environments with excellent teachers, excellent professionals. And I honestly, I love most of the, the teachers that I do training with. Um, really putting their best foot forward, really caring so deeply about the kids. But in the research that we looked at, right, it does say that kids who have emotional dysregulation are rated with less social skills, right? They're, they're rated to have less favorability in other, you know, in their learning environments. So when our learners 
can't adequately express like that's their fault if they did something and really stand up for themselves we're actually setting them up for even greater failure that they're already at risk for so in our play situations we can entice again a approximation of these situations so that they have to stand up for themselves and you know I have done things with learners where I'm just like, you know, I won, I won, ha, 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 ha. And doing, you know, that's not nice, but it happens, right? And I'm working with this child to say things like, that's not nice. Okay, we should be better now. Sorry, I didn't realize that this wasn't plugged in. Okay, so here's an example of someone giving directions successfully. Hold up tight. Mm -hmm. Set up. Nice. nice. That's awesome, Thor. Good Hold job. Hold on tight, sit down push and then it works okay good all right and then let's see what happens <laughs> there you go. Daddy got it. Good instructions, Thor. You told him exactly how to do it. Yay! Uh, back up, ready? Yeah. So you see, Dad expanded. Dad expanded on the play situation immediately and taught that little reverse sound, right? Beep, beep, beep. I'm backing up. And and that's just another expansion of the play situation. It was fun. This child really loved um, giving us directions and, sh you know, showing that we would follow them, right? That be the teacher type of programming. That means that whatever you say is what's going to go. And that, you know, when you don't give directions exactly the right way, the outcome is going to be different. All right, teaching make-believe stories for problem solving. Often teaching is required for problem solving, right? This can happen at very young ages with simple cause and effect stories. Some examples. Uh, one day, Bobby bumped into his friend Joey's block tower. The tower fell over and Joey was mad. Bobby said, I will help you make the tower again. And they all felt better at the end, right? It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be elaborate. You can uh, write a story like this together, ask them what the person's name should be, or just make it up yourself. You know, you can create a little paper with this, with little pictures if you want, and then act it out. 
and see if this person can role play with you being, you know, Bobby or Joey or whoever. Once upon a time, a princess fell and scraped her elbow. Her mother, the queen, put a bandage on her elbow, kissed her, and then she felt better at the end. All right, it's just very simple. There's a problem, there's a solution. Something bad happened, someone fixed it, and it was over. And we are using these beginning little tiny stories to talk about how when something is uncomfortable, it can get released quickly. When there's a problem, there can be a solution just to start introducing problem solving. Here's a very cute video about that. I love this one. <laughs> Once upon a time, the girl said, said, let the mom pick up and everyone is happy <laughs> the end. So as you can see, you know, once at a time, the girl was sad, her mom picked her up, and everyone felt better at the end, right? That was his own story that he made up. And it was about something that he related to because he loves having his mother pick him up and helping him feel better. So he, he really appreciated just making it about somebody else. And we would talk about it and we would watch it. He loved the selfie mode, clearly. And, and that was fun just to make a video. Also, I didn't list it here. But if you haven't looked at video modeling research and self video modeling research, do that, okay? Because that's, that's really, really useful and it is an effective strategy. Okay, problem solving with self, pretending you are a character in the game or activity. This means that you and the learner are physically involved in the problems and the solutions, okay? Imitative behaviors likely need to be learned, such as rocking a baby, giving a bottle. I see that all the time. I see that in some random program about play skills, or I see it in object imitation, right? Rock the baby or receptive language, rock the baby or do this. Be flexible in what the problem is, how it looks, how it sounds. In order to translate to a real life situation, there needs to be great variety in the play. For example, a baby might cry because they're hungry, they're hurt, they need to be changed, they need attention. A mother will need to tolerate more crying for varying situations and may respond differently. Right? Mom might not always feed the baby. They might change the baby or play with them. Be sure to include this variety in the play scenario so that the problem solving varies alongside the actual problems. Please do not teach the baby rocking imitative behavior or receptive language program only. Right? You can do that, but don't just like don't just teach that. Take it to the next level as much as you can, as soon as you can. Okay, so here's a tired baby going to bed. When never knows the greeting would not when the bell breaks, the cradle will fall. Down will come, baby, cradle and all. For a test, I to the baby, helping the baby feel better. And notice that it was a monkey. It wasn't just the baby doll. You don't have to only stick to certain characters. We want to expand and expand. Like I said before, you can start with like humanoid, some, humanoid, something that looks more typical so that this child can relate to the character more if you need to, but try and expand and get more and more abstract as soon as you can, right? And just promoting generalization across people and setting situations. Problem solving with self, again, pretending you are a character in the game or activity also includes gameplay with other characters. So you can also do this with actual games in order to teach the gameplay so that the instructor isn't the only other player. This leads to more diverse outcomes as well as role playing for various issues that may arise in the gameplay. Maybe someone doesn't understand the question, right? Maybe they complain a lot when they lose, or maybe they just can't figure out the answer and they're upset. I did this recently, and if you haven't noticed the star of all of these videos and pictures, 
um, is a, a wonderful, wonderful kid that I just totally adore and love working with. And obviously his parent gave me permission to use any of these. Um, but you can see that I have this whole setup here, right? With these different stuffies and, and animals that he loves. And they have different personalities. And when we're playing this game, which is already kind of difficult, headbands, again, is a game that builds in that theory of mind piece because you have to inhibit telling the other person what you see because you know what they have on their head. Like he has popcorn on his head, right? So if if one of the characters told him, you're popcorn, that would be upsetting to him because then he can't win. So he can, I can model that for him as something not to do and then work with him through the scenario of how to respond when someone upsets you during a game. Also, if he tells the stuffed cheetah, you're an ant, right? Because the little bug insect on the cheetah's head, I don't know if you can see that, but if he tells the stuffed cheetah, you're an ant, the stuffed cheetah is a stuffed animal, right? I could either make that stuffed animal say like, hey, you're not supposed to tell me, right? Because that's how a peer might respond is being upset that the game is blown that they just told them. Or I can have the stuffed cheetah say like, oh man, now I don't get to guess. And you can, you know, you can contrive and control the different situations and the responses that are involved in the gameplay. And the gameplay itself is hard. Like this is already a hard task and we just, added some extra characters in order to really facilitate a more natural situation because I didn't have, you know, peers that I had to pair with reinforcement and see what their interests were and see if they were compatible and all that stuff. I just used different actors that are available to me in pretend play. And also when we were doing a lot of this, this learner started picking up more and more and more on engaging with animals and giving them conversations and giving them activities that they could do together. Okay, so you can use the characters to engage in problems. It ensures that rigidity isn't built into the gameplay and it entices emotionality due to the need for being flexible in the real time problem solving strategies that are needed. Be prepared with scripts, right? Or mnemonic devices to help you learn to respond to the problem and get back on track. At this time, re-engaging in the expected outcome, which does allow for some rigidity, is the reinforcement, plus whatever additional reinforcement you have planned. These dinos have been through a lot. Okay, so you see this line of dinosaurs. They were actually in school in this situation. All these dinos were in dino school, and they were on their way to the playground. And I took a picture of this because what I did was one of them tripped and fell and was crying. Now, this character getting out of line and disrupting the flow of getting to lunch and recess, which is what was, you know, the end of this kind of rigid play experience that this learner wanted to engage in, was enticing emotional dysregulation, something that in involves flexibility, being patient, tolerating other emotions, and helping. So I had the dinosaur trip and fall and get hurt and the leader dinosaur or the teacher dinosaur had to stop what they were doing, come on over, say, what's wrong? Do you need help? Do you need a hug? And also that being patient part and just giving them some time to feel better. And I, at some point said like, okay, I feel better really quickly just to control the length of tolerance that was required and get that negative reinforcement built in. Let's all go play. Yep, I feel better, thanks. And then later I, you know, increased it. I changed the problem a little bit. Maybe they had to tie their shoe. Maybe they felt sick. Maybe they had to go to the nurse and they're not gonna get back in line. Oh no, so it's not gonna be the same as it always is. And now we have to increase and just wait. We have to increase our tolerance and be more patient. So it's all contrived and you can build in the differential reinforcement and you can build in the, the length of time and the intensity of the issue and just really systematically tweak and dial up what is being tolerated and how the emotion is being regulated. So here's putting some things together and we're gonna be wrapping it up soon. This is one of our, our final videos. I just gotta make sure I get it started at the right place. 
Yeah. So we're going to start at 54. Okay, so this is kind of same idea. We have some whiny dinos here. Mm. What's wrong? Um, I wanted to play. Okay. I want to play. Oh, thanks. So I was whining because this dinosaur didn't get a chance. And instead of saying like, hey, can I play? This dinosaur said, oh, I didn't get a chance to play. And then you can hear the kind of tension in his voice, like, okay, I'll teach you. But like he came out with a solution to get the dinosaur to learn how to play. Cool, thank you. Hmm, I never got a chance. And new dinosaur I'll teach you. Here you go. Oh, and thanks. That's the job of saying I'll teach you. Rock and roll! But this dinosaur didn't play it the right way, the way that he taught. This dinosaur just went nuts and did rock and roll, which is different and needs flexibility. Oh no! It's him up. Hey, Mr. Tyrannosaurus, can you play one more time? Oh, okay. I want to hear what you did. I'm trying to do this. And this time I asked, can his dinosaur play it again? I want to hear it again because he displayed such great flexibility with my rock and roll crazy dinosaur, even though he did fix up the, the little chimes in the xylophone and put them in the order that he wanted them to. He didn't get upset that, that this dinosaur was upset. He didn't engage in any of our target behaviors that were, you know, trying to decrease. He did express, you know, I can teach you. So now I said, hey, can you show me yours again? And that allows some of that negative reinforcement to get back to some level of that, you know, what he actually wanted the outcome to be. And, and let's see what happens next. hear his tone wasn't very inviting he was trying to say like okay because now right we were supposed to wrap up and go home and 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 my dinos were like wait we never had lunch I'm so sad again and he was like okay we can have lunch look at all these foods and I just said what like because I, I don't understand you maybe if he is expressing himself in a frustrated way that might put off some of his peers in his class so to him this dinosaur just said what and he's like, look, we have all these foods. And he immediately chilled out the tone of his voice. Now they're all eating. Hey, I want some. <laughs> so, as you can see, right, he was able to express a lot of flexibility and be helpful with his dinosaur friends. So just remember that, you know, we want to be very mindful and it takes some practice and some experience and, you know, in teaching that a failure is part of a learning experience, we should also be that graceful towards ourselves, um, towards our parents, towards our professionals that, you know, if you haven't experienced teaching through play, that it does take a lot of practice because you're going to need to learn those fine lines about each individual that you're with and how to not only um, approach and be successful at the games themselves and then expanding them and getting creative and wild and changing things, but also like you have to be on your toes a lot and not stick to the same play routines all the time. You do that. To an extent, right? Like we, we had practiced 
some of the lava stuff. I changed it up each time, but some components of it were similar. Some of the dinosaur activities were similar, but we were constantly just manipulating and changing and dialing it up such that there was a lot of flexibility growing all the time. So just be mindful that you know, when you're trying to start this, maybe you haven't done it before with a particular learner or your own children, that you're not gonna just go from zero to lava like in, in one day. And, and like maybe you will, but that you can start by some basic, you know, problem solving um, scenarios that are really quick, maybe just a minute, maybe just starting to talk about some characters and just introducing the idea of pretending. And you know, even before that, if you want to watch the the other workshop or even review with me, you can always email me to talk about just play development. You can expand the play skills and the emotional regulation pieces at the same time and just start folding them in very systematically. So in closing, please remember the kids, seriously, they need to have fun. They need to. It's not like a an option. They really do. It's really, really beneficial. And if you want to go review our slides, go look back on this video in YouTube, you can to, to look at, you know, the AAP, like big, major collective professionals agree that kids really do need to play. So it has to be a priority in our programming for people with learning differences. Create as much engagement and creative changes to your activities as often as you possibly can. Clinicians, consider what level of control exists in your programs. Why? Do you need that specific stimulus control? You may, right? So for certain programs, you really may need that specific stimulus control. And sometimes you don't. And you might be failing to expand and generalize across stimuli um, because you're exercising just too much control over certain things. And that actually leads to decreases in generalization in the future. Parents consider, what can I do to begin expanding my child's play repertoires? What can I include into those activities to promote flexibility, patience, expression? What type of reinforcement is avail available for that game? It may not be fun right away. Again, that was something we covered in our previous workshop. Just because it's called a game doesn't make it fun. Okay, so we have to make sure that we have the right kinds, levels, uh, rates of reinforcement available um, for different games that we're teaching. Everyone consider the impact that emotional regulation has on child's social success, the reduction of potential stigma, their emotional expressions, control over their affect, and the ability to control the environment and to seek help. Those things, you know, if that's the biggest thing that you can take away is that emotional regulation is really involved in so much of what we do and that we should be folding it in and and looking through avenues of fun and play in order to teach our learners and do rehearsal strategies to get them to play in novel and ever-changing, um, sometimes emotionally arousing situations that are approximating real life situations that they're gonna face and have to engage in their emotional regulation in those spaces. Okay. So it's time for questions, if anyone has any questions. And before we get to that though, your last word is night. N-I-G-H-T. And remember, it will not be repeated. We can't tell it to you in the chat later. This is your final word, N-I-G-H-T, night. So now that you have your three words, if you're getting our CEUs, you'll email those three words your name and your certificate number to ray at abaskills.com. Awesome. Amazing, Marsha. Very good. You know, I have to say yes. that um, it's been a long time since I've had the opportunity to work with a learner and teach them sarcasm and <laughs> assertiveness, two of my favorite things to uh, yes. To a teach, especially when uh, uh, kids stumble across something that makes everybody laugh, and and then it's just part of their part of their repertoire forever. Like a, yes. just a quick story is a a long time ago. I was working with this um, child. I was an instructor. I it would, and I think um, Scott Wright was actually the uh, supervisor, and we were working on this. Um, it's kind of like assertiveness program and we taught him that 
sews your face is an appropriate response to many different things. <laughs> That's awesome. Right. And That's so, so I, I, I remember one time his, his, uh, his uh, brother, you know, who also had his own challenges, you know, took something from him and called him a jerk and this and that. And I was yeah. just waiting to intervene. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the uh, our, our learner said, so is your face. And it just kind of <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't know, like he didn't know what else to do or say. And I was like, wow, oh, that's... Good that's exactly what's yes. supposed to happen you know yes. anyway. that's okay. awesome so there's a question from an rbt and she Great. says and she says hello i have a question when a child is exhibiting fighting behavior when upset bored or excited uh what is there uh what is the play scenario i could use besides prompting him or her to express him or herself should i be proactive and pretend to be sad and let him use one of the steps mentioned, breathing exercises, asking if a hug is needed. Are you okay to bring him or her away from the biting behavior? Okay, so um, tell me the three things that they said again, bored, excited, and what? Um, upset, bored, upset. or excited. Yeah, so it sounds like the biting is is crossing over a few different functions, right? If they're doing it when they're bored versus to you know when they're upset or when they're excited then it's happening in the absence of emotional arousal it's happening amidst emotional arousal and there should be you know this is not a replacement for but is in an addition to proper functional analysis and behavior intervention protocols so the bcva that's leading that team should certainly have in place you know, proper consequences based on functional analysis that are leading to a reduction in biting. Okay, so if we're assuming that that's already in place, then we can start talking about um, practicing play situations that you can then proactively, you know, provide some teaching, right, that would maybe further prevent that behavior. When we talked about like prediction equals prevention, right? So if I know, for example, that I take something away from someone that they might engage in biting if they're upset, right? Then in a play situation, I might start creating, just so I don't know this learner and what their language capabilities are, but just off the top of my head, let's say I had two puppets or two dinosaurs or two superheroes and one of them stole from the other one, they would say, hey, give it back. And, oh, okay, sorry, I didn't mean to take it. Just to start modeling what should happen to face that situation properly. And then if you're also then engaging with the learner in a play situation, you know, let's say you set up that you, the learner and two stuffed animals go to a picnic and you have some little toy foods out and everyone's pretending to eat and then a stuffed animal reaches over to you as the instructor and steals the apple right out of your hand and you say excuse me give me back my apple and then they give oh sorry i didn't mean to okay all right fine right and then you progress later to it happening with the other person and you would probably want to control not taking away like their iPad when they just earned a break after work, right? So you wouldn't want to like interrupt um, the reinforcement that's being made available that maybe is isolated, that maybe is highly desirable and a lot of response effort went into gaining. I wouldn't entice that in that situation and be like, oh, I'm just kidding. You know, I'm just playing. No, that is not the time or place to be doing that. But if you're in a leisure situation with them and trying to say, teach them, uh, a game that they're not super interested in. You could just like slowly take away the piece, maybe use a text cue or maybe an immediate verbal prompt that says, hey, give it back. You know, say, hey, give it back. And they give it back. Oh, great. That's what you do if someone takes away your toy. That was awesome. Hey, you know what? This game stinks. Forget this. Let's go play with your iPad, right? And just start building in small, very like low approximations of the functions of the behavior. And of course, talk to your BCBA about this. 
that you want to build in some rehearsal strategies through some play scenarios that will allow this learner to have more contrived practice in the proactive strategies that you're then going to consecrate the same way you would in the BIP that they have in place. Got it. Cool. So um, there's a few more questions. The first okay. is, how, how would you incorporate these play slash emotional skills in school, question mark, or mm -hmm. remotely, question mark, and mm -hmm. are these things that you're doing um, during parent training? Um, first, yes to all. Right. Actually, the big celebratory thing I had today with this person saying I'm frustrated because I don't know what to say happened over remote instruction today. So it's certainly possible to um, promote emotional regulation across the the virtual platform. That's number one. Um, in parent training, for sure. I actually have parent training weekly with a family that I'm asking them to be really, really mindful and contrive opportunities for their kid to tell them, leave me alone or stop that, or I don't like it because they're really, really good at prompting and reinforcing things that are like nice and polite but they need more training and more reinforcement on their own behavior to train the resistance language. So yes, in parent training, for sure. School is one of the more complex scenarios because you have so many players, right? You have all of these kids. And so if you're going to teach emotional regulation, which you should, so when you're going to teach emotional regulation in the classroom with a variety of learners, you just have to make sure that you're controlling that approximation piece, that you're not like, like I said before, like setting up a big sports game sometimes can be really enticing for emotional arousal. You don't want to set up like a highly competitive game and then just like start putting out fires on everyone's emotional dysregulation in the game. If you want to set up small groups, like let's say you're doing a game for prepositions in your speech or in your small group for math that when you pull the kids aside to do some small group learning with them, you can build in some scripts and some reinforcement strategies for the group. And also about um, group reinforcement, that's also in the other workshop when you're talking about like you know, the hero procedure or like interdependent uh, reinforcement strategies for groups. So when you are teaching your group, I would control the size. I would control the emotional arousal that you're enticing in the game with that group. And I would be super proactive with coming up with like mnemonic devices, sing songs, um, script cards for them to know what to say to each other and then provide a ton of reinforcement for them for doing and saying the things that you're expecting. Um, there's a lot of nuance there and it's very person specific and it's very school specific and obviously curriculum specific. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me and I would be happy to workshop how to incorporate some of these play things into your classroom. Excellent, okay, the next is, is there a play curriculum that you're using with your learners at different um, at different levels? No, <laughs> I wish there was. Um, and I've been thinking about creating one actually, um, but I'm not using a specific play curriculum. I'm following individual interests and play abilities. Um, I do consider the part in research and you know just what we know about parallel, associative cooperative play and I think about where my learners are in in that kind of breakdown in that part and breakdown and then I also think about what reinforcement they actually currently find you know pleasurable that I can use to increase their play skills and when I start increasing play skills it might be very simple and just start with some tolerance of my interaction with them when they're doing something and just those basic sharing and turn-taking skills. Those, those skills are so foundational to so much more, more, more play, right? Those play skills snowball very quickly. 
And so if you have a learner who has difficulty taking turns, has difficulty sharing, like don't play Monopoly with them. <laughs> that is, that's just not, you're not gonna jump to something like that. That's a really intense, competitive, involved, executive functioning, theory of mind. There's like a lot involved with a, a complex game like that. Start with some basic sharing opportunities and maybe even you, you don't go to that cooperative level. Maybe you start at the parallel associative levels just to get them to share materials with you and express um, some, you know, give them some reinforcement for waiting. Like if you are sharing materials, let's say like crayons, and then you give them differential reinforcement for using polite language to problem solve. Like, hey, there's only one black crayon and we're both trying to make bats today for the Halloween activity, right? You're gonna build in some ways to capitalize on individual interests um, and, and really shape the behavioral expectations with differential reinforcement. Okay, good. I think we're going to have to have like a uh, follow-up workshop to uh, this. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'd love to. Yes, that's, that, that's it for the questions. Okay. Thank you, Marsha. That no was problem. amazing. And if you could just remind everybody again um, where they can send their keywords to, Great. that would be awesome. Okay. Also, the references are at the end. So anyone who is getting CEUs that's going to get our our slides, you're gonna have the list of references for your own further reading, which I suggest that you do. So um, so just so you know, we gave three keywords today and they can't be repeated. You will have an opportunity to review them in YouTube if you need to, like if you missed one, we'll upload it to YouTube like within the next couple of days uh, at most a week. Um, and the three keywords that you wrote down, you should send to ray at abaskills.com. And for our previous workshops, you can find them on YouTube. For our future workshops, you'll find them live on our ABA Skills Facebook page. And then, of course, they'll be added to our YouTube um, channel. And for any information on our events and our services, you can go to abaskills.com and follow us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Fantastic. Thank you again, Marsha. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Have a good weekend. Bye.